Titanic. Whether you're referring to the James Cameron movie or the historical vessel herself, either way, it was the ship of dreams. Famous for its luxury and legendary for its sinking, a trip aboard the Titanic was literally a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity. But was the ship of dreams truly as memorable as the film makes it out to be? Ladies and gentlemen, this is Historodame, and today we're discussing what it was like to spend a day aboard the Titanic in first class. When it set sail for its maiden voyage on April 10th, 1912, the RMS Titanic was by far the most luxurious vessel on the ocean. Known for its impressive size, beautiful interior, decadent food, and extensive facilities, sailing aboard the ocean liner was indeed an experience like no other. But in order to enjoy all that the ship had to offer, you of course needed a first-class ticket. For those wishing to travel in style, Titanic offered two types of first-class accommodation. The cheaper and more common of the two would afford you a standard first-class cabin, which in 1912 cost around £30, or the equivalent of nearly $4,600 today. But if you really wanted to flex on the poor people, there was also the option for a first-class stateroom ticket, which was a whopping £4,350, or around $133,000 today, still more than most families make in a year. It was not uncommon for members of first class to travel with their personal staff, bringing with them on their doomed voyage maids, valets, governesses, nurses, chauffeurs, and even personal chefs. Those who purchased a first class ticket would be met with facilities that were far nicer than any other ship at the time. Each cabin contained either a single, double, or triple berth sleeping accommodation, a dressing table, sofa, wardrobe, and a wash basin with a marble countertop. Most beds had an electrical outlet nearby, along with a button that could summon a steward, as well as a reading lamp and a small basket for storing personal items. All first-class cabins also had electric heaters, to help fight off the frigid chill of the North Atlantic. For those staying in one of the first-class suites, they would be met with even more elaborate decor than the standard rich people cabins, with each room themed after a different historical period. Kind of like a fancier version of a Disney hotel room in the 90s, except instead of Ariel, you get the Italian Renaissance. Most of these suites also had private entrances, as well as separate servants' quarters and ensuite bathrooms, as opposed to the other first-class passengers who would have to share bathing facilities. But if you can imagine it, there were two suites on B-Deck that were even more decadent. Known as the Promenade Suites, they contained two separate bedrooms, a sitting room with a fake fireplace, and a private promenade deck that was connected to the first-class entrance area. But of course, if you were sailing aboard the Titanic, you weren't just doing it for the opulent interior design. You were also there to enjoy some of the ship's many services and entertainment facilities. Although there was not much in the way of organized entertainment, those who were in first class still had no shortage of things to fill their time. If you wished to get some exercise, there was a gymnasium that included a variety of equipment, including two electric camels and an electric horse. There was also a large indoor swimming pool that was filled with seawater and was routinely heated, as well as a squash court and Turkish bath. Outdoors, the entirety of A deck was reserved solely for first class passengers, so you wouldn't have to worry about mixing with any of the poor people while you went out for a walk or enjoyed some outdoor games, like shuffleboard, dominoes, and chess. Deck chairs could also be rented for around four shillings each, so you could spend some time relaxing outside, reading, and enjoying the near freezing Atlantic temperatures. Back inside the ship, there were also many public rooms that were reserved for first-class passengers, such as the reading and writing room, where you could relax, read, and write letters to family and friends. There was also the first-class lounge, which was one of the most elegant rooms aboard the Titanic, and was modeled after the Palace of Versailles. Here, guests could socialize and enjoy coffee, tea, and refreshments before and after meals. 
Male passengers also had the additional option of going to the smoking room, where they could receive cigars and drinks or partake in card games and gambling. If asked what aspect of traveling aboard the Titanic passengers enjoyed most, it is likely that many would say the food. Dining aboard the Ship of Dreams was an experience to say the least, not only because of the decadent meals, but also because of the opportunity to socialize and bask in the best that the ship had to offer. Those in first class would have the most variety when it came to dining options, and could choose between the first class dining saloon, the exclusive a la carte restaurant, or one of the two cafes aboard the ship in order to take their meals. First class dining began with morning tea, which was an optional meal that could be served in your cabin, consisting of tea, scones, and other pastries. For those that wish to dine like hobbits, they could also partake in second breakfast, starting at 8.30 in the enormous first-class dining saloon. The breakfast menu was different each day, but usually offered a variety of eggs, omelets, three kinds of potatoes, fresh fruit, ham, sausage, fish, and baked apples. Lunch was served starting around 1, and offered selections such as chicken, corned beef, vegetables, grilled mutton, custard pudding, and a plate of cheeses. Between lunch and dinner, passengers could also go to one of the two cafes on board, which were reserved for first class only. The Café Parisien offered the same food and drinks as the saloon, but with a different kind of atmosphere. This café was a more casual environment, and was popular among many young adult passengers, for socializing and enjoying an afternoon tea or coffee. There was also the Veranda Café, that offered gorgeous views of the ocean, with its large windows and sliding doors that opened onto the promenade deck. The main event of the day, however, was dinner. The evening meal was a more formal occasion, and passengers would dress to the nines before heading off to either the saloon or the a la carte restaurant to socialize with other well-to-do members of society and probably talk about how rich they were. Not only was dinner the fanciest meal of the day, but it was also the largest, offering around 10 to 13 courses and lasting for several hours. The final dinner that was served on board the Titanic had 10 courses, including various chicken and seafood dishes, lamb with mint sauce, roast duckling, a palate cleanser of punch romaine, cold asparagus vinaigrette, beef sirloin, and much, much more. Dessert was also served, which had options like Waldorf pudding, custard, and eclairs, before the meal was finished off with a variety of cheeses, coffee, and cigars. Passengers enjoyed this meal immensely, and a good thing too, because for many, this would unfortunately be their last. There were 324 first-class passengers traveling aboard the Titanic that fateful night. Like with everything in life, being wealthy had its advantages, because those in first class had the highest survival rate of any group of people on board. This was not necessarily because the first class passengers were given priority during evacuation, but rather because the extra staff dedicated to serving them and the location of their facilities being near the upper decks gave them an advantage. Since the stewards assigned to first class were only responsible for a handful of cabins each, passengers were given hands-on assistance in getting dressed, fitting themselves with life jackets, and being escorted out onto the decks. This was a sharp contrast to those traveling in third class, who may have only had a single steward overlooking dozens of cabins. So many of the poor passengers were not properly informed of the situation or even told what was going on. Because of the assistance they received and their natural advantage of location, most of the people that boarded lifeboats were from first or second class. Even still, as a member of first class, your rate of survival greatly depended on your gender and which side of the ship you were lined up at. The two officers that were carrying out the operation were given the order to start loading women and children into the lifeboats. Both of these men interpreted the order in different ways, with one loading women and children first, and the other loading women and children only. 
the greatest survival rate of the disaster was afforded to first-class women, with only four deaths among the group, giving them a chance of survival at 97%. Next came the children, who had a survival rate of 83%, and men, 33% which may not seem like a lot, but was worlds better than their third-class counterparts, with a rate of only 16%. Overall, if you were in first class, your chance of survival was around 61%, proving once again that all the money in the world still can't save you from Mother Nature's wrath. At least your last days were spent using that money to pamper yourself before the end. Hey everyone, thank you for watching. If you enjoyed the video, please consider leaving a like or a comment down below. If you want to see more content like this, you can also subscribe to my channel and keep up to date on all the fun history videos of the future. But for now, I bid you farewell.